Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, and I'm really thrilled and pleased to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And for those uh, who are participating, and if you uh, worked in schools uh, this past year, uh, please know how much we appreciate your efforts and the things that you've done. And I'm, I'm so honored to share the stage with so many distinguished leaders in education who you have heard from this morning and who you will hear from uh, later today, certainly including uh, Secretary Cardona. And uh, Bill and to all the colleagues of CAS who uh, thought it important to put these webinar, this webinar series together, much appreciated. Uh, we know how critical this, this issue is uh, for us going forward. And so I'd like to talk to us as I looked at the topic of equitable leadership in action. And in action is really a key word uh, because it's so important for us to move beyond the talk uh, and really move into action. And what I'd like to share with you uh, in for a few brief moments, uh, and uh, in our next slide, you'll see a presentation overview, uh, you'll be able to see uh, what we wanna talk about today, a little bit about the education landscape a little bit about elevating student voice. I know how important this is for CAS and in the work that you're doing and some implementation of equity focused policies because that really is important. And so uh, pleased to bring to you the work uh, of the agency and the work that we've been doing in the aspects of our curricula, our school discipline and attendance, which is so important. We recognize uh, as we've done this work uh, in uh, the, the pandemic uh, that has uh, impacted all of us, how important it is uh, to make sure that whatever we do is uh, addresses uh, some of the inequities that we know existed in our state and community uh, and certainly impact in our schools. So I wanted to start with really just getting everybody at the same place uh, about Connecticut's educational landscape. As you can see uh, that we do have a very diverse uh, student body. I'd like to always talk, talk about a beautifully diverse student population. Uh, and as you can see that more than half of our students identify as non-white. 42% uh, are eligible for free or reduced price meals. 16% are students with disabilities. 8% are English learners. And it's really important as we think about the context in which we do this, this work. Uh, as you can see, you see the numbers of our school districts, uh, our certified and non-certified staff, and the information at the bottom, which I so proudly share everywhere, is the fact that you know through the, the school year, uh, thanks to all the hard work of our, our educators and our partners, uh, that by the time we got done with the end of school, by the time June rolled around, that there were no school that was fully remote in Connecticut. There were no districts that were fully remote. And so that is uh, certainly an, a really important achievement. I also wanna add what is not on the screen, but I think it's important when you go back to the demographic of our students that there's a hundred, about 145 non-English language spoken by our English learners. That's about 145 non-English language uh, spoken by our English learners. And when we add it all together and add in the non-English learners, there's over about 180 different languages spoken. And so when we think about the demographics and the important uh, uh, and the linguistic, linguistic diversity, that is also important to keep that as a backdrop of the work that we're doing uh, as we go forward. I also want to share the importance of elevating student voice, which I know that you do at, at CAS, but for all our participants, uh, it is really important that we hear from our students. Uh, they're the ones that are most impacted and they, it shouldn't be about them without them. And in preparation for last school year, we conducted two thought exchanges just to hear from students. We asked them about remote learning and among other things, they reported wanting to return to school in the building, returning to the school building safely. Uh, they also talked about the need for greater mental health supports uh, and appreciation for, for their teachers and their schools, adaptability with everything that was going on. What's on the screen though, I really is important for you to take a look at. Our State Board of Education heard from two students uh, who would have served on our board had not been for COVID. And they spoke passionately about the experiences that they've had over the last year. And one student uh, spoke about what he had seen in our world over the past year and passionately stated that schools and students should take it upon themselves to have tough discussions in environments where everyone is comfortable to learn and encounter different opinions. And I thought that was so poignant as I was invited to talk to us today to really put that in 
because it is so important. And, and we recognize as that these are tough decisions, tough conversations, uh, some of them certainly being uncomfortable. And so thank you for engaging uh, in this conversation today. And that is a backdrop uh, for what I wanted to share in the next few moments. Ensuring equity and excellence is the title of our State Board of Education Comprehensive Plan for Education that was adopted in 2016 to 2021. And those words may, may seem to have more sig significance today. However, I, I always like to share that, that that uh, document that was implemented by your state board back in 2016 was a great driver of all the policy work that we've continued to do in the Department of Education. Uh, and one of that document uh, work that we did was really working on the a position statement on culturally responsive education. And, and keep in mind, and the date here is really important, that was first issued in 2011. The importance of collaboration among stakeholders to build high quality, comprehensive, coordinated, and culturally responsive education programming. This position statement was, was um, revised uh, just in, in 2020 uh, and so important uh, that I want you to see that that is not new work in the agency, but work that we're continuing to do. The other thing I draw your attention to is a joint statement on the issue of a culture of uh, importance of a culturally responsive education that was also issued by partners. And you can see CAS was a partner here, where we talk about improving the academic lives of Connecticut's increasingly diverse student body as shared in that original slide, the diversity of our student body in Connecticut, uh, with the shared goal of wanting to make sure our students graduate as responsible, well-rounded, productive citizens who are ready to engage with others and to thrive in our interconnected, diverse global society. I wanted to uh, bring, I'm sure that most of you are aware of this, uh, of the Black and Latino Studies uh, curriculum that was signed into law in June 2019. I know that CERC is a part of this, this uh, forum and certainly uh, kudos to the work that they did here in making sure that this had broad participation uh, and they put together an advisory group of over 150 members, as you can see, who were really uh, instrumental in this development uh, with the purpose of making sure students will graduate with a better understanding of African-American, Black, Puerto Rican, and Latino contributions to our history, uh, our society, economy, uh, and our culture. And there's more work to be done there. I'm proud to say that we've just funded, uh, provided funding to CERC to make sure that there's professional learning for those educators who will be implementing the curriculum. So we could say yes and do a checkbox that yet we achieved this, it's done, but we recognize execution, implementation in the classroom in front of our students critically important and wanted to make sure educators are prepared to do that. The other uh, work I really wanted to share with you and I, a shout out to Kim Traverso, who I know is here uh, uh, in this conference is the work that we've been doing for over a decade on school discipline, uh, really looking at the disproportionality uh, in suspensions and expulsions in Connecticut. And pleased to say that intensive focus that we've had for the past decade is paying off in terms of reductions in the numbers that we see of in-school and out-of-school uh, suspensions, uh, and critically in the incidents coded as school policy violations. We've looked very closely and disaggregated that data and focused on that. Uh, however, while those numbers are trending in the right direction, we still see large disparities in suspension rates between Black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino students, uh, and when we look at uh, their white counterparts. So again, this is policy and equity related policy in action. Uh, again, that we've been working on for a very long time. I know that you're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Graves after, after this, and uh, we've actually implemented here a school discipline collaborative to which we've, we've uh, actually just, I have him here as a, a member of, of, of our collaborative where we are again, focused on the, that, that work and that effort. We've implemented, just based on all that, just recently implemented a tiered system of support to target resources and a system to the districts that need it most. And the primary metric used to determine the district's tier for this support is their suspension rate and disproportionality between races uh, being the other factor. 
And I won't go through the slide, but I really put this here just for you to see and to recognize and to understand when we talk about equitable leadership, that it means put it into practice beyond the words, beyond the statements uh, that really executing and working to support the districts as they do this work. The same is true for chronic absence efforts in Connecticut. Uh, that has, again, has been something that we've been working on for well over a decade and seeing results. Uh, however, we know the barriers, what we saw through the pandemic and the challenges that, that our learners were having just to get to school, uh, just to participate, even if they were participating remotely, uh, we were able to disaggregate the data that we were collecting. We stood up a data collection system and one of the, maybe one of the only states or a few states that were able to do that in the pandemic, we were able to get monthly data to see that we disaggregate uh, by our, our, our learner demographics, by students experiencing homelessness, students with disabilities, uh, all of that to help to, to make sure that we could be intensive and, and uh, be targeted in our approach uh, to support our, our students and families. And so we were able to do that. A great program that we set up is a learner engagement and attendance program, uh, which provides families with resources and supports. And since we set that program up, hundreds of home visits have been done uh, with folks working with families to provide them the needed supports. Again, we're talking about uh, policy in action. But the work doesn't stop as we talk about going back to school. It doesn't stop with putting districts in tears. It doesn't stop with just looking at discipline data. And it doesn't stop with the, the Black and Latino studies. And it certainly doesn't stop with a position statement as I've indicated here. It's the work that we're doing every day. And I can assure you that we are dedicated and committed to make sure that we continue to do this work with this uh, in an equity focused lens and to continue to do that. The resources on your screen, are, you know, $1.7 billion uh, that we've been fortunate to have in Connecticut uh, specifically uh, to address our education uh, issues here in our state. Uh, and we are really being intentional that we're uplifting uh, our students, uh, students of color, students with disabilities, English learners, uh, our students experiencing homelessness, disengaged youth, or youth in foster care, students from low-income households, students involved in the justice system, students who experienced barriers to remote learning or those whose progress was disrupted that our priorities for funding, uh, looking at learning acceleration, family and community engagement, uh, looking at healthy, safe and healthy schools, social emotional learning and mental health supports are all critical levers that we are working at here at the department and also supporting our districts in also doing the same. As we look at the fall, look at bringing our kids, our kids back into the classroom where we know they learn best we know that there are uncertainties and other kinds of things that we need to work through, but our goal is really to use these funds to reimagine schools to transform student lives. So it really is very important uh, for us as you're engaged in this conversation uh, that along with CAS and all our partner uh, organization that will continue to provide the resources necessary, the guidance, the support, the leadership to our districts, the collaboration with our partners, to reduce the negative impacts uh, that we've seen uh, so, so well established. Uh, and also we have the data uh, to be able to, to share as well uh, around its impact. So I look to all of you today who are part of, uh, of this uh, webinar series that we continue to engage in productive discourse uh, that we can not, not be afraid to have the tough conversations that's so critically necessary uh, for us to be able to get our, our students on track. So uh, more about action. Uh, as we go through our talking, uh, let's make sure we're action focused and action oriented and we stand with you as partners in this work. All right, I think I did my 10 minutes there. Uh, Bill, thank you very much.